Welcome to The Art Elevator. I'm your host, Larissa Wilde. Join me on this weekly podcast as I dig deep interviewing art historians, curators, appraisers, artists and more to bring you lifetimes of knowledge in a digestible format to elevate your knowledge of art. Today's episode is the start of a regular series called Shop Talk with Appraisers. In this episode, Sarah, Rita and I chat casually about frequently asked questions we get as personal property appraisers. Let's jump in. So how do you handle this one, Sarah? I have a lot of people come to me and say that they need an appraisal and it, and it turns out that maybe they're just looking to, to sell it or they maybe don't need an appraisal. What do you do when you get those phone calls? I get those all the time as well. People, uh, they call up and they say, I need an appraisal. And then in talking to them, it turns out they probably really don't need an appraisal, but they're thinking of maybe they're selling someday or they just think, wow, maybe this has some value. And it's tricky. As appraisers, it takes us time to responsibly process those kinds of inquiries because, you know, if we work in compliance with the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice, like you and I both do, we have a lot of professional uh, responsibilities and duties. So I talk talk to the people who call me up like that, kind of get more information about what they truly need. And uh, if it turns out they really do need a legal appraisal report, then we can move forward with that. But oftentimes they really just want some peace of mind for moving forward with their decisions. So it may be a quick conversation about the overall market for a certain type of item. Like I I can't usually give good news about humble figurines. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but uh, it, other times it may be something where I can point them in the right direction for somebody who would be able to assist them with their needs. Yeah, and it, it does take up a, a, a lot of time. There's a lot of knowledge and research in in being able to say, you know, you probably don't need an appraisal. There's actually, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, background to be able to get to that point. I know you, you have a lot of like uh, cheat sheets that you can uh, check out and blogs and your worthwhile magazine. So you can go in and, and answer those questions. That's brilliant. I love that idea. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I that was a uh, hard one through a lot of time spent on the phone with people. I finally reached the point where I thought, let me just write an article about this topic. I spend a half hour discussing with somebody pretty much every day. And so now I can just email it out and it's there. And then even, you know, 24 seven, people can find it on the internet and, you know, learn. And then they're better informed when they do reach out to me or if they live, you know, somewhere else, they reach out to somebody like you and your community. And so I've been trying to work my way through all of those frequently ask questions for appraisals because it's really tricky if you aren't an appraiser. I mean, of course, the general public doesn't know these things. Why? How would they ever know? So I feel like it's part of, uh, you know, my responsibility uh, in the field to help educate so people can be better informed when they reach out to professionals like us. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. That's, it's very noble of you too, because all of that stuff takes a lot of time to create that content. But I guess it's time saved in, you know, having that same 30 minute conversation every day. Um, And so what what are the types of things that you get uh, requests on frequently that you redirect people? uh, What type of objects? What are the ones that are you redirecting on mostly? Uh, Well, things that just, it's really not cost effective for someone to have an appraisal done because, you know, it's, it's a service that is, you make a choice to invest in if you have an art collection that needs to be insured for uh, protection, or if you are handling an estate or equitable distribution among siblings. So those are all uh, types of, of events that it would make a lot of sense to have an appraisal, but say someone calls me with a a decorative arts item that, you know, if you go on eBay, they are, I can find a hundred of them that are selling for under $50. That's not a, it's, you know, a situation where it makes sense for someone to responsibly have appraisal services. So in those cases, I just try to say, you know, on eBay there, you, you can see a lot of examples just like yours. That might be a venue if you'd like to sell it. So it's, I don't buy or sell in my firm. I just appraise. So that's another thing where when someone's looking to sell, I try to uh, point them in some venues that, you know, have a good reputation for selling whatever type of item they have. But it's usually it's that equation of, is it even going to be worth this person investing in appraisal services based on the worth of the item they have, which it's a lot of pro bono work for people like you and I up front, because we have to really do that work to even assess 
is it going to be uh, in the best interest of this potential client to engage us for appraisal services? So it's it's a, a chicken or the egg problem, really. I haven't figured out a good solution to it yet. <laughs> yeah, and I think all of us appraisers do have that same same dilemma. I know, you know, some will just say here's a minimum charge and that will just make people do a lot of the research themselves. But, um, you know, you brought up a really interesting point there about guiding them to the, the right market. And that's a really interesting one because in these cases when people are just like, oh, do I have something of value? I might cash it in. Um, knowing that although they might see retail prices in a gallery and they think, oh, well, this is worth all this money, realizing that those markets aren't available to them to get that full amount. You know, they're going to have to pay a large gallery commission or even just looking at auction results, you've got the premiums. And so, you know, understanding the best market for people to, if they do want to sell stuff um, and, and what what tag goes along with that because they're not they can't expect to get the same price that a dealer who's been building a reputation in this particular genre for 20 years is going to get it's a different market exactly and I wrote a whole article about that too the levels of value because it's it's such a, a widely misunderstood concept and yeah people see a really nice retail price and they go oh well I have that sitting around I'm going to cash that in but they don't recognize that the dealer who's listing that item as you said you know has built a reputation over decades specializing in that type of item is paying the rent on a, a you know a gallery in an expensive urban center has employees has insurance has all all sorts of, of costs involved with being a, a, you know, a recognized dealer in that type of object that, that, you know, a person who owns the item, they don't have all those costs. So even in any kind of sale, you know, there's going to be all sorts of hidden costs that, or, or deductions and discounts for where you can really access the market realistically as just a, you know, somebody who is a collector. And that's what people don't quite understand. And often when, once I go through all these costs or say auction costs, because they're costs for selling at auction, sometimes people say, well, I think I'll just keep it then. <laughs> so, yeah. I like and, it more than that dollar amount, definitely. Yeah. 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 And, and that, um, I mean, that really comes down to like, you know, when, when people call us, the first question that we ask is uh, when they say they want an appraisal, what's your intended use? And then, you know, you have to usually explain what intended use is and you kind of touched on some of them. It's, is it for insurance purposes? Is it for fair market value because you need to settle an estate or because you want to make a donation? Is it equitable distribution, but it's not going to be under the IRS um, regulations or do they, are they thinking of selling? And, you know, just not to discount that, yes, you might want to get an appraisal if the piece is worth a lot of money. So that's where, that's where the gray area lies with that selling, because, yes, you do want to get an appraisal done if you're looking at a high ticket item. But the big question mark and big gray area is how do I know if I've got a high ticket item? Yeah. Yes. And that is, is the canyon that we don't really have a good solution for in the field because there are, I mean, I think we all have the stories where someone's reached out to us with something and they say, oh, I don't know if this is worth anything. And it turns out it actually is worth a lot of money. And it's a good thing they did reach out to us because especially yeah, in a, a planned future sale, the for more expensive items, having the guidance about the right type of venues and the right level of the marketplace can make a huge difference in the, the profit that the owner realizes. So it's, it's that sliding scale of, is this going to be cost effective to invest in the professional services based on what the item is? And so it, for, for important items, it really is cost effective. It can make a huge difference in, in the return in the profit for, for a future sale. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, just uh, in mentioning, you know, what was the intended use? It, that's one thing people really have a hard time getting their head around. And I know when I first became an appraiser, it was a concept that you really had to get clear is, is why are there different values for a single object? Um, you know, why, why are you going to have a different value for insurance as for fair market value? Um, do you have a really clear way that you just you explain that to, to people who you work with? I am in the middle of writing an article about this very topic because it, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, it's uh, so uh, desperately needed for people to be able to understand this properly. I have that phone call all the time. People say, I need an appraisal. And I say, what's your intended use? And then there's this moment of silence as they're thinking, well, what's an intended use? And then I run through all the different options for them. And they say, oh, I had no idea. I just thought there was an appraisal report and there was one value. And 
historically, I think it, in the field, we haven't, you know, it, it, there's kind of been this, this chasm between, uh, you know, the end user and the appraisers. And so people are coming to us without the, the true information that can help them save us time and money and also save them time and money so that they can say, you know, I need an insurance appraisal report. My insurance agent said I need one. Here's my scheduling threshold. You know, I have 15 items that are, you know, above that scheduling threshold that I'd like to get appraised. Like <laughs> if I could get phone calls like that every day, oh, it'd be wonderful. But <laughs> yes. we just, that, that general knowledge just isn't out there right now, which is part of why I, you know, I, I have my list of of articles I'm, I'm working my way through writing so that hopefully it can help all of us and the you know our clients really have a, a much smoother process in in generating their appraisal reports i love it i absolutely love it and i say thank you <laughs> <laughs> You're um, welcome. so so if you were to just say to somebody um you know what's the difference between uh the the value for insurance and the value for uh donation um how would you explain that in, in sort of lay terms so that people get, get the idea? Sure. I, I really, I mean, I always can follow up with the very explicit and detailed IRS language, which is a great thing for anyone who needs a fair market value appraisal to review all their documentation because the IRS does have many publications outlining this. But it's the big picture concept is for insurance, what you are getting from your insurance company is the settlement that's the amount of money to go out and purchase uh, something very, very similar in a short amount of time. So it's going to be a much higher level of value, the retail level of the market, because you can't wait around studying all the different auction houses for the next three years to wait for, you know, the perfect uh, comparable replacement to come up. And then you can maybe get it at a bargain, assuming that there isn't a bidding war on the item. So generally the fair market value level of the market, which often correlates, not always, but often is uh, correlates to the auction level of the market with a, a willing seller and a willing buyer, it's much, much lower and can be very much lower depending on the object type than the retail level of the market because there's that element of time and you know how your insurance company, because you are paying a premium for insurance, that means that if your house burns down, they're going to give you a settlement that is enough money to go out and replace the you know your your belongings with like items in a fairly short period of time because you know you can't wait for <laughs> three years to you know have furniture to sit on yeah yeah exactly or to replace that beautiful painting or that beautiful design object and and that's the whole reason you have insurance so that I explained well it really comes down to you know you have your insurance so that you can replace this and then we're going to be looking at retail replacement cost in order to do that and you know looking at auction results is is going to give us a very different level of market although sometimes at the at the high end they do overlap and fair market value but it's it's very rare most people's collections aren't going to fall into that category but we do you and i probably appraise a lot in that category they're the, they're the ones where we do a lot of the the work where it does tend to sometimes overlap yes yeah, and, and it's certain object types, depending on where they sell, the most common market can be different. And so it's it's very much a case-by-case -case basis, which is another thing that isn't commonly understood. But yeah, the big mm -hmm. picture, generally speaking, not folding in all of the many exceptions is that uh, people, and this is another problem when people say, I have you know this painting, I wanna donate it. It was appraised for insurance for you know some very large sum of money. And then you and I have to be the people explaining to them that that is not the fair market value that the IRS is going to be looking for. And they then that's that's a very disappointing conversation as well. So it, it works the other way too. Yeah, speaking of disappointing conversations, sometimes that's the hardest part of the job is, you know, you can have that misconception on what something's um, going to be valued at for those, for the donation purposes. Uh, because they, they, they're comparing the retail price that they paid, or it could just be um, like more of a passed down sort of Chinese whispers family history on the value as well. I, I get I get that a lot, you know, it's like, you know, it's been in the family for so long that the value of it grew with each generation and the stories. 
Yeah, age does not necessarily have a correlation with value, sadly, but mm -hmm. not not always. And then markets change. That's part of why insurance agents uh, recommend to ha that clients have their uh, appraisal reports updated every three to five years because the markets change. So something I encounter is that people have been told by a uh, uh, you know an elder family member this is really valuable, Be like. 18th century furniture, because at the time that they were, you know, buying that, it was a much stronger performance in the market. You know, I've, I've seen gallery receipts and antique dealer receipts from the 1980s and early 1990s for, you know, great 18th century furniture pieces that were a lot of money, and they're not going to be selling for that now, even in the retail level of the market. So that's always a very tricky conversation, too, to explain that, you know, it's not that that parent or you know loved one was wrong in saying that they were worth a lot of money. It's just that the market has shifted, and that it's all relative. With you know, it's it. We have to deal with the financial worth at the effective date, you know, of the appraisal report, the current moment. But it it can be very delicate separating that from you know a, people taking it personally about our sense of worth of the object inherently. So there's always that that psychological subtext that we have to navigate through very carefully. It really is. And I love, I've just been taking your Silver 101 course. Thank you. And it's fabulous. And I really liked the way that you explained that, um, you know, silver plate versus sterling silver. At the time, the silver plate was just this incredible technology and it was super practical. And when you understand the context, it, it does make a lot of sense. And um, I thought that you are really good at explaining that that historical context and, and worth at that point in time and then and, and gently explaining the market now. Thank you. Oh, that means so much to me. I really appreciate that. And that is very much my guiding philosophy and what I do because I, I like to approach those difficult conversations from the context of education and empowering my clients so that they really understand that it's it's not a personal judgment on something that has a lot of meaning for them. It's it's simply all of these different factors that fold into the market and then are are very you know sometimes very dry and technical and legal work that we're required to do professionally so mm -hmm. i find that it really helps ease that that moment of realization when people can go oh i i understand now you know it's up for, for this and this and this it's not me saying something that you know there is going to hurt their feelings yeah, that is so important because if somebody has a collection, you know, you've got you've got the side, the money worth side that, that we we deal with, but the other side and the side that we're also passionate about is the fact that they are collectors and have treasured these items and they have informed their lives and you know um, they have the nostalgia attached to them. So that that's a beautiful way of tying the two together in 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 a way that um, brings the picture that is the true story but at the same time gives value to the to the backstory of it. Yes, yes. And I love that you touched on that point because I think that that's something we share. I It just absolutely lights me up being able to help deepen people's knowledge about these objects that have, you know, brought them joy in their life and that they love. And so there, it's always the two spheres uh, that we balance. You know, there's the, the work we literally do, which is the legal and financial, uh, you know, valuation analysis. But then uh, the passion that people have for their collections, I, I mean, I that to me is, you know, so important and not to be uh, undermined just, you know, or, or I, I always try to be very careful to, in all my interactions with clients, to have them feel really positive about their appraisal experience. It's not something that it can would have a negative impact on on their relationship with these objects going forward after our time working together. Yes, yes, I, I, I totally agree and I'm totally on board with with that same value. I you know it's interesting because that does bring up that whole idea of um, this misconception of of art as an investment. Um, oh yeah. In those cases, in some cases it is, and but that's and we we hear about those cases in the media, of course, because they get attention. You know, like the Salvador Mundi, four hundred and fifty million dollars, or whatever whatever the taglines are that make the news. And because, like in any social media platform, anything that gets the headline feels like, oh, this is this is the art world in general, and it's it's usually the exception, not the rule. 
Yes. Yeah. The one percent. Exactly. And then and then suddenly there's a flurry of phone calls and emails where everyone's thinking, well, maybe I have a four hundred and fifty million dollar piece. And it, that oh, I, I just groan whenever I see those headlines because I know, oh, this is going to take me so much time to process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So which appraisals do you end up doing um you know obviously you work full-time as an appraiser so there there are lots of cases where an appraisal is needed um what would the bulk of your work be be? is it like 50 50 with insurance and irs uh what what's your what's your story there that's a great question thank you and i feel very fortunate to be able to work with a a diverse uh, community of clients i would say the bulk of of my appraisal assignments are uh, split probably uh, relatively 50-50 at the moment between insurance appraisal reports and estate appraisal reports. And uh, insurance appraisal reports are such a valuable protection for collectors because if you don't have your collection appropriately covered in it, uh, with an appraisal report in your insurance policy, say your house burns down, say there's a hurricane, say there's a water main leak, then you could possibly lose your entire collection and not receive any financial settlement to be able to uh, rebuild your collection. And so I find that people, uh, you know, they nobody likes to read the fine print. And so, you know, you get this very, very small uh, print policy from your insurance company every year and you think, oh, I'm, I'm paying something, I'm fine. But uh, often you don't a lot, find a lot of people don't fully recognize the limitations in their current coverage and you know that they may not be fine if some if a tree falls on their house and and destroys you know the room where most of their expensive art was hanging and so in my experience insurance agents love it if you call them up and say can we talk about my policy i want to make sure i understand that you know what my coverage is oh they'll take those calls they'll take those calls all day long and you don't have to do anything different with your policy but it can be very empowering to go okay I am covered up to X amount of money if something, you know, happens to my, you know, my collection or if I have a, you know, damage or loss or fire. And, you know, if I wanted to upgrade it to uh, increase coverage, it would cost me this much more per year. And that's the other thing. Insurance premiums actually are not nearly as expensive as people think they are. It's kind of that that fear of the unknown. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's I always. uh, in fact, the first thing I do when people call me and they say, I need an insurance appraisal. So I say, what, you know, have you reviewed your policy? Do you know what your coverage is? And they say, oh, no. <laughs> so it's like, please call your agent and find out exactly what you need, because that helps us determine the scope of work. You know, some often people say, I need an insurance appraisal on everything in my house. And I usually answer something to the effect of, you don't want to pay me to do that. <laughs> right. yeah. Because that really wouldn't be cost effective. And so uh, just getting that kind of information out. But again, if you don't have that, you may have a total loss and receive no financial settlement. So that is a great investment to make sure that things you cherish are protected. And then for estate appraisal reports, it's it's really the gamut. It's not always a, a taxable estate for the IRS. I find that appraisers can be of great utility in uh, being kind of the impartial uh umpire for for uh, families who are working through a really traumatic time and you know there's there's been a loss in the family there's uh you know the handling the estate all of the tangible personal property of the estate which people it, nothing in my experience inspires strong emotions more than the objects that belong mm-hmm. to a loved one it's it's all wrapped up in that object and that's totally independent of their financial worth as of the effective date but I often I'm brought into situations where there actually isn't a legal need for, you know, the IRS or state or probate court to do an equitable distribution appraisal report for state purposes because it will keep the peace. You know, it will prevent siblings from having a feud. It will prevent, you know, future lawsuits that would cost a lot of money for for the family. So this is a place where appraisers, I think, are such a good uh, resource and well worth the investment in an appraisal report because 
since we're USPAP compliant, which for your listeners, uniform standards of professional appraisal practice, it means we can't have a vested interest in the objects we're appraising. So this is where, you know, if say there are two siblings and one sister says this, you know, this bowl is worth a million dollars. Well, that sister's not an appraiser. So, and the other sister says this bowl is worth a thousand dollars. That's where somebody like you or I, who, you know, what it's, the bowl is worth what it's worth. We are not part of this feud. We have no relationship to it. We don't benefit from taking one stance or the other. That is where we can be so helpful because then we can come in and say, well, actually it's worth, you know, whatever it is worth. And here are the three comparables that show, you know, these are very, very similar bowls and the effective date and here's why. So we provide that clarity and transparency of market data that can really, really help prevent or mitigate uh, family discord. Yes, and that that makes me think of a, another thing, which is, you know, because a lot of people will say, well, why would I get an appraisal there when I can get one online and it's free or it's cheap? And um, I, I think that the difference there, and, and that's just a, why would anyone know until you know, is if you're a qualified appraiser, you, you're trained in ethics and methodology and you have the use PAP uh, um, standards that you hold to and then we update every two years and so what we offer is a completely um, unbiased opinion whereas if you were to go to perhaps somebody who had an interest in selling the piece and they offered just a, a you know an appraisal in that realm it can get sticky because they they may be off they may be saying it's worth more because they want to get it to sell or they may say it's less for other reasons so we are offering an unbiased uh well documented well researched report which you're not going to always get from from galleries and places that say that they offer so-called appraisals exactly yeah that i always uh would encourage anyone listening to ask themselves a the question what, who, who, you know, if for somebody they're, they're considering working with, whose interests is this person representing? You know, are they entirely just being impartial or do they, you know, would, could they be influenced by, you know, a future outcome? Like, yeah, would, would their appraised value be influenced by whether they would like to obtain that piece to sell in the future? Or maybe they will hope to purchase the piece in the future, which by the way, you can't do that under USPAP, you know, I would never do that. So I think that, and this is something that isn't commonly known, which I wish it was much more commonly known because yeah, there are all sorts of low cost, you know, things out there. And to that, I say, you get what you pay for, you know, what uh, appraisers like you and I, who are qualified appraisers provide is a professional service. That's a legal service, like a lawyer or an accountant, you know, you, you wouldn't really feel comfortable having, you know, the, the $10 special to get your taxes prepared for the IRS. So right. <laughs> why would you feel comfortable doing that with an appraisal report, which you, you know, uh, if you have to go to court afterwards in that was not a use PAP compliant appraiser who prepared an appraisal report, you, you are, are in a much weaker position in any future legal proceedings. Yes, yes, it might seem like the, the best option short term, but long term it can cause there's, there can be a lot of repercussions. On to a positive note, what's your favorite <laughs> thing about appraising? I really love working closely with clients. Uh, because, uh, and I've, I've been fortunate to work with some really awesome clients, and it's that being able to develop that relationship over time as we work together, and it's it's a very intimate thing we do, because we're, you know, in people's homes, usually, when it's not the pandemic, and we're learning about, you know, the stories that are embedded in these objects that have a lot of meaning for, and memory for them, and so I always feel like it's, it's a, a very... It's a, it's a privilege to be able to witness that and be a small part of that in a way that is going to deepen the person's relationship with the objects and help protect them, the objects that they care about. And so that I think to me is my favorite part. It's, you know, there's there's the economic side and the legal side, but just that the, the core of meaning and being witness to, and often people are in a moment of transition, you know, especially in state situations, it's, it's can be very raw. And so it, I, it's a, I consider it a privilege to be able to help be a, a useful resource in those times. 
Yes, and I would agree. I love that side of it. I love seeing the passion and the the care and and the, the particular stories that people choose through what they choose to collect. I find that absolutely fascinating. I also really like the detective side of it. Yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> but following following the clues and 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 just the the world of intrigue that that opens up. I find that really fascinating too. Oh, that's a great point. I know I love those aha moments and then to be able to, you know, share something back with a client that is, you know, a revelation to them and, uh, you know, helps cast their, their relationship with this item in a new light. And especially when it's a positive <laughs> discovery, it's really fun. Yes. Yes, it really is. Well, awesome. I always love chatting with you, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's always so much fun to chat with you. Thanks for joining us on the Art Elevator today. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. If you found this podcast to be super helpful, please leave a review to spread the word. If you'd love to hear about something else, let me know too. In the show notes below, you will find links mentioned in the interview, plus a link to receive an actionable checklist where you can start applying what you've learned here today. Here's to elevating your life with art.